the wisdom book of Proverbs, the 13th chapter, verses 22. A good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children. But the wealth of the sinner is stored up for the righteous. A good person, I don't know about you, but I think that's me. A good person leaves an inheritance to their children's children. A good person leaves an inheritance to their children's children. Tell the neighbor that's two generations removed. For the subject this morning, I'm going to talk to you from the text. You be the one. Look at that neighbor and tell them, you be the one. You be the one. You may be seated. In the presence of the Lord, you be the one. On this first Sunday of the year, as I meditated and prayed on what this first message of 2020 would be, the Lord impressed in my spirit. This verse here in Proverbs, and it really speaks about an individual, but it speaks even larger about that individual being measured or that individual being looked upon after they're gone. Talks about a man, or we want to broaden and expand the word, which we can do and it still be appropriate and be proper in its context. A woman, a person, an individual, leaves an inheritance to their children's children. That, that speaks more and not so much about where a person is now, but how a person will be viewed maybe years or decades after they're gone. So while I don't believe that this is a somber text or a somber thought, I think it's a very practical word. I really believe that it's a right now word, even though it speaks to years removed. And as all of us have lived some length of time, at some point in our lives, we stop thinking about where we are. We begin to think about what will be said about us when we are gone. Don't want to depress anybody. I certainly want to remind you to make sure that you are keenly aware of the fact that you're not going to live forever. All of us will leave here at some point or another. As I've said, we're all on the expressway of life but everybody has an exit that they've got to come up on. Sometimes we're flying along in the fast lane until we think that we're going to be here forever. But life has a way of moving us from the fast lane to the center lane. <laughs> and from the center lane to the right lane. Nobody rides in the right lane unless you're getting ready to come up. <laughs> All of us have an exit lane, an exit on this expressway of life. Some of you have gone through some rough times in 2019. And as I was looking at some individuals, uh, Rhonda Morgan, who had a heart transplant and successful and 
able to be back in service at 7.30 in the morning on a consistent basis. And from all indications, it looks as though the heart that she received is adapting to her body and, and, and she's looking good and, and it looks like she's moving forward in life. And I was looking at Brother Bill Green, who had very serious heart procedures last year and, and now has batteries that uh, his testimony are attached to him 24 seven and his body needs that and his heart needs that to be able to maintain some regular regularity of beating to keep him functioning in as normal a way as possible. As I look around this congregation, I see Pastor Edwards had very serious heart challenges. I see Elder Jackson, who's had medical procedures, and many others of you. And even some of you that have gone through the strain and the stress of losing loved ones, and you lost a mother, uh, Sister Kim, or you lost a father, or you lost a wife, Brother King, or the list goes on and on and on. And I would dare say, Sister Venus, that there were some times last year that clothes really didn't matter. There was a time last year where a new car or a new address or zip code really didn't factor into your thought process. Uh, maybe there was somebody else that it's all they could live for and even die for. Um, but in your life, uh, you had some things going on that just caused many things that used to mean a lot to you not to have much value at all. And I guess the longer that we live, the more we become mature to know that life can have you so misfocused during much of your life that it's not until you really get to somewhat the end of your life that you really realize what you should have been paying attention to all along. I mean, I mean, life, life is something. Uh, somebody said, man, you live, you run, you chase, you argue, you fuss, you fight. And then you die just trying to figure out why in the world I spend my time running and fighting and arguing and fussing. And you'll say, Lord, if I had known then what I know now, uh, I might not even be sitting next to the person. Don't, keep looking at me. Don't look. <laughs> Do not nudge that person. Nobody talking about you. <laughs> But as I've said before, and you heard me say it and echo it, maybe on numerous occasions, that it's only after you have heard some things and seen some things and experienced some things and gone through and endured some things that you can begin to even understand some things. But I would say most of us in here who have lived the length of time I'm not concerned with things that moved us in our 20s, not even our 30s or 40s. You know, we're, we're way beyond that. And, you know, if people come to you with that kind of stuff, like, man, please, whatever. <laughs> way beyond that. Been there. But you begin to think about legacy. You begin to think about what will be your legacy? What will people say about you when it's all said and done? Uh, would anybody have even got you? Did they even really know you? Did they even really know what moved you or what was important to you? Anybody that's been going to this church uh, for any length of time that considers me their pastor, uh, would never uh, buy me a fish dinner because you know by now I don't eat fish. But as I bought you a catfish and I'm telling you, you got to try this. I'm not going to try it. 
I see that I won't like, see, he don't, he don't like me. Then now you done moved to another church. You don't even know me. If you knew me, you would know that I don't eat fish. So it doesn't matter how succulent it is, I'm going to give it away. If you would know me, you would make me a cake, and I don't know that you make cakes. Amen. That's for the armor bearers. Bishop, that's a good cake over there. Can I have some help yourself? If he come back next week, then I might. <laughs> if he come back next week, I might cut me a slice. Amen. If he at home sick, it's gone. <laughs> Will people have even gotten you when you leave here? Will people be up at your funeral talking about stuff? And if you could say something, you're like, sit her down, please. What is he talking about? Yeah, I, I know he used to love it. He didn't like that. He began to think about legacy. and The Bible here talks about a person's motives, a person's objectives. Talks about a person's dealings and a person's provisions beyond their life. He talks about children's children. What are you leaving as a legacy? What, 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 what are you leaving as an inheritance? What, 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 what will your children receive from you? What will your grandchildren receive from you? What, what, what will they have learned from you? What, what will they have heard you say? What, what kind of mannerisms will they exhibit? And folk are asking, why do you do that? Oh, I don't know. You know, I just, you see my grandmama do that. I see my Nana, my, my, my Pawpaw, my, my Gigi do that. Because at the end of the day, whether we think we're leaving something or not, we're all leaving something. It, it doesn't necessarily have to be tangible things as cars or, or, or property or real estate or cash or things that you can put your hands on. Sometimes the greatest gifts you can leave are the intangible gifts. We all know here uh, that the greatest gifts that God has given me has never been a car. It's never been a trip. It's never been a set of golf clubs. It's never been a home. The greatest things that God has given me have been the invisible things, the, the intangible things, the, the peace that I have, even when people come after me. The joy that I have, even in the midst of rough times, I can still smile, still crack a joke, still laugh, still, still, still feel decent, even when things in my life are upside down. Those are the greatest things that God has given me, but it takes you time to appreciate those things because during much of our lives, we're always chasing stuff. If I can just have another stuff, if I can just have another this, if I could get two of them, I'd be set. And you got five of them, and you're still as miserable as you can be. Sometimes it's not until you have lived a few years or decades that you really start valuing things the proper way. We've read scriptures all our lives, you know, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto us. Matthew chapter six. So we, 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 we quote those verses, but we, do we really get what Jesus is saying? Do, do we really understand the message that he's driving home? Do we really get what he's trying to show us? Because he really is trying to tell us something, not just something we can quote, but something that we can live. Sometimes you wake up and your life is over. And now, what will people say? What will you have left to that next generation? The Bible says a good person leaves an inheritance. Doesn't say what the inheritance is, but it says that you got to leave something. And you leave that something, not just to your children, but to your children's children. And 
one of the questions I ask today is, what are you leaving? What are they learning from you? What are they hearing you say? All of us receive something from somebody. Uh, the way you talk. Uh, yeah, I, I would guarantee you that if I was born in an Asian family, if I was even raised in an Asian family, and not born to an Asian family, I wouldn't be talking like I'm talking today. I'd be talking a man from that dialect, of that culture, of, uh, of, of, of that nationality. Um, but I was not raised in an Asian family, so the reason that I talk the way I talk is because that's what I heard David and Wilma Ellis say. And the reason that I have the mannerisms I have is because that's what they taught me. The reason that I get up every morning is because that's what they instilled in me. Well, yeah, ever since I had the Holy Ghost, man, I've been getting up early every morning. No. <laughs> the Holy Ghost don't make you get up in the morning. I, <laughs> no, man, man, ever since I've been reading the Word, man, man, a lot of time when I read the Word, it puts me to sleep. There are things that God teaches us, not through his word, but through the people that he puts around us and that he puts in our lives. And you have to be careful who you spend most of your life with. You got to be careful who you allow in your life. Uh, those that you allow to associate in your life, those that you let in your home and those that you spend your quality time with. Tell the neighbor, be careful, be careful. Well, well see, Bishop, I ain't got too many friends. Who said you need a lot of friends? Uh, uh, sometimes you spend your life trying to make friends only to find out you didn't need but one. So all of us are leaving something. You've heard me say it before, perhaps uh, one of the wealthiest men in the world, Warren Buffett, was interviewed, and I don't remember the show or the program, but he was being interviewed, and they asked him about what was most important to him, asked him about his life, asked him about his wealth, his success, and all of that, and then they talked about his legacy, his inheritance, and they asked him, they said, well, well, well who are you going to leave your inheritance to? They asked him how many children he had. He said, I mean, he had, and, and he said, well, are they going to inherit all that you have and be responsible now for your legacy and for your name and for your work and for those things that you were passionate about? And then he said, well, well, I figured that I'm going to leave my kids enough to do something. But I'm not going to leave them so much that they don't have to do nothing. Uh, care, buddy. In other words, I'm going to leave them something that they can have a great start. And, and they can even go further than I did. But I'm not going to leave them so much that they don't have to do nothing. I, I'm going to take care of some of my legacy. I've got money going to universities. And I've got money going to these different uh, benevolent uh, programs and, and social programs and stuff. Because I can't be assured that somebody is going to do everything that I would do when I'm gone. So I'm going to endow some things myself. Uh, because Warren didn't believe that you ought to just lay around doing nothing. Yeah. And, and listen, uh, he must know my mama, amen. Because my mama, uh, you know, we thought that summer vacation, when school was done for three months, we thought that that was time when you could just sleep all day. After all, you've been getting up at 7.15 every morning to make it to school by 8.30 in the morning. And we thought, it's summer vacation. Well, now nah, I don't have to set no alarm clock. And I don't have to get up. And I don't have to go nowhere. But we found out that summer vacation is not sleep all day. Because Wilma Ellis would get you up. Mama, I ain't got no school. Good. Okay, come on down here. We're going to clean up this bay. Oh, Lord. Jesus, have mercy. Where did my mother get that from? Well, she was raised on the farm in Huntington, Tennessee. They didn't need alarm clocks. They had roosters. 
that crowed every morning when the sun came up. Are y'all hear what I'm saying? Uh, so, so, so that life that she was trained on the farm in Huntington, Tennessee, uh, she brought that a man to Chicago with her when she met the choir director at this little storefront church, which was my dad, and, and they fell in love, and they began to start a family. You know, my dad was used to going to church all night and sleeping early in the morning, but my mother said, oh, no, 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 no. No, 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 no. These kids got to get all leave them kids alone. Oh, they tired. No, I don't care if they tired. They getting up. And thank God she didn't listen to my dad. Thank God she made us get up. That, that, that's why you have a pastor that's not lazy. That's why you have a pastor that ain't never called in sick on a Sunday. Because Wilma Roof said, you got to get up in the morning. Nobody's going to give you nothing. Nobody owes you anything. You have to get up. Uh, the early bird catches the worm. Uh, mama, I don't eat no worm where you ain't hungry. Amen. Uh, the, the early bird catches the worm. You got to get up. You got to do something. Well, I ain't got nothing to do. Worst thing to say because now she got a whole list of what you going to do. And tomorrow, what you do? Oh, I got plenty to do, mama. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm good. I, I'm good. So what Arvy and Trula Bardwell instilled in her and her siblings, she brought and she instilled that in her children. And, and me and my wife now are instilling that into our children. Everybody has to do something. You, you know, I told y'all uh, back when I had a Bentley and a Mercedes and, and Kia and Buddy were younger and they're, they're in the back seat and I'm taking them somewhere and, and Buddy was the one that started the conversation and he talking about, like, yeah, which car dad you gonna have? <laughs> and I'm saying, <laughs> I'm listening to y'all. <laughs> uh, no, I'm gonna get the Bentley. You can have the Mercedes. I'm like, am I dead or what? me? <laughs> I mean, folk in the car divvying up my stuff as if they can't get their own stuff. Where I bought my Bentley from, they had a whole lot of them on the lot. Where I bought my Mercedes, they had a whole lot. You ain't got to hope I die so you can have my house. You can buy a house. They build one right across the street from me. Brothers and sisters, everybody got to do something. God has not raised you or me to do nothing. Uh, I pray that when it's all said and done, I would have taken what somebody gave to me, what somebody left me, and did something with it to take it bigger into a better status and to put it on another level. Because I want to hear the Lord say when he come inquiring of me about my talents, the Lord, I've multiplied this that you gave me, and this is what I have now, so that I can hear him say, well done. Done, that good and I don't want I don't want to tell the Lord well I had so much and I ain't had to do nothing I just took it easy and I just buried it and you know I just went golfing all the time and I just traveled the world oh the Lord said oh, I created you with purpose I created you amen with, 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 with destiny I put greatness inside you brothers and sisters y'all ain't saying nothing I believe that God is expecting something out of us if, if you're in that rut where you just doing what you've been doing and all your life, it's time to find you another dream. It's time for you to find you another vision, another passion, because God created us to be fruitful and to multiply and to replenish the earth. Adam could have just rested and called it a day, but God said, oh, 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 I place you here to do something. To, well, well, Lord, everything looks beautiful. That's because I made it beautiful, but now you got to keep it beautiful. You got to take care of this earth. You've got to tend it. Sometimes people give us things and we don't do nothing but lose it or we waste it away but that's not who God created us to be I believe that God if he gives you something he expects you to make it better I believe that if God gives you a talent he expects you to exercise that talent if he gives you a gift I believe that he expects you to craft that gift and to perfect that gift ain't nothing worse than being lazy with what God gave to you I don't want him to call me slowful I don't want him to call me slucker I don't want him to call call me wicked. I want him to say, well done. Is there anybody that want to please God like I want to please God? So then the Bible says that a good person leaves an inheritance to their children's children. 
Now, none of us can uh, help or be responsible for the way that we were raised or who we were born to. Tell a neighbor that wasn't your choice. Uh, whoever you were born to was who you were born to. Uh, whoever you were raised by, that's who you were raised by. And, 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 and as I look at my life, when I think about being a third generation Pentecostal, a third generation church person or raised in a church or religious environment or to have a church experience and culture, I see now how blessed I am. I mean, are you kidding me? Now that I'm in the position I'm in and I'm helping people go through, uh, get through uh, traumatic experiences that they have in their life. And I'm helping people to overcome all kinds of things that have been downloaded in them and endowed in them. Uh, 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 prostitution or abuse or, or, or dysfunction or substances or, or being called out of their name or being treated like a dog or or poverty or or or, 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 or systemic evictions and moving from place to place or, or or abandoned disowned and now you're moving from family to family and and when i see all of that i'm like good god almighty that could have been me not that the lord couldn't have couldn't, couldn't have saved me out of it. But thank God, that ain't something I had to go through. I, yeah, yeah, I got my own things I got to work through. But thank God, that ain't none of it. And I, I ain't got to get the thoughts of somebody climbing in my bed. And I ain't got to get the thoughts of somebody cussing me and trying to knock my teeth out. I, I ain't got to get the thoughts of raising myself because my mom and daddy are drunk or on drugs. I ain't got to get, hey amen, the taste of heroin out of my veins. And I, I don't don't have to thank God I'm in a third generation uh, Pentecostal family that don't mean we've always been angels but God through that upbringing have sheltered me from some things didn't even know how blessed I was had no clue when I'm in school I'm trying to fit in with the other folk when I'm in school, I'm trying to hang out with everybody else. I, I, I'm trying to go to the blue light basement parties where you had to pay the quarter at the door. And, and, and as soon as I come down the steps, hey amen, I mess with everybody's height of all. Oh, Lord, what he doing here? I'm getting offended. They acting like I can't do this. They're like, man, can you leave, please, so we can go on with what we're going to do? They knew I didn't belong. Y'all ain't hear what I'm saying. Uh, but they knew I didn't belong there. Thank God that I didn't come up in that kind of atmosphere. Thank God that wasn't my light lot. Thank God God didn't choose that for me. Thank God that I was born to who I was born to. And thank God they left me an inheritance. I'm not talking about money only. Uh, I'm talking about they, 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 they taught me some things. And, and, and there are some things that I got to watch over my years of life with my father. There are some things that I'm yet watching over the years of life with my mother. And, and, and most of you all know that I'm a very historical person. Whenever you hear me talk about this church, I talk about it. Amen. Way beyond a four-year-old boy coming here in 1962. When you hear me talk about the history of this church, you hear me talking about the early days when I wasn't even born. Because I don't think that you should be over anything that you don't know. You ought to know the history of what has been entrusted to you. So that as you're moving forward, you know where you come from. So that you can move forward in a vein that, hey amen, takes care of the legacy of what has been entrusted to you. And I look at where I am now. A lot of people look at me and say, man, yeah, man your life has been just picture perfect. Well, my life ain't never been picture perfect. 
Oh, no, man, you became one of the youngest bishops in this organization, man, and you inherited a big church from your dad, and, and, and everything was paid off, and y'all had $4 million in the bank. I said, yeah, thank God, because a lot of people started in a storefront, started in a school auditorium, but that don't mean that I, gotta, I can sit down and not do nothing. I got to do something with what has been left me. Oh, man, you became one of the youngest presiding bishops. Yeah, yeah, thank God for all of that. But as I look back on that, I see so much now where it didn't even have anything to do with me. It had everything to do with the people that raised me. It, it, it had everything to do with the prayers that went up before me before I was even born. It, it has everything to do with the legacy, with, with the inheritance that was laid up for all of us in the Ellis family by people that we didn't even know. I didn't even know my grandfather. He was born in 1900 died of a heart attack in 1953, November. Didn't even know him. Named after him. My dad was only 18 years old when his father died, so he wasn't even married. He got married the next year at 19. My mother was 20. So I don't even know my grandfather. Then I don't know Charles Hayward Ellis I see pictures of him, and, and there's one audio tape that I can hear him preaching. Kind of sounds like my dad. People tell me I sound like my dad, so I don't know. So, so you don't ask for that. You don't practice that. But I guess it's in you. It's a part of the inheritance that has been given to you. It's a part of the legacy that has been bestowed upon you. When I look at my dad and all the things that he did, I'm like, man, how did he do all of that? Why did he do all of that? But then you got to go back to where it all began. And when you see Israel, they're always talking about the God of Abraham the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Because they said it didn't start with Jacob. Yes, his name has changed to Israel and he's got the 12 sons and blah, blah, blah. No, 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 no. It started way before that. You got to go back and check his daddy Isaac out. Yeah. But before you end there, you got to go back and check his granddaddy uh, Abraham out. That's where it all began. And, and, and my Aunt Cena, who's still here, hey man, who was the baby girl in that family, it all began with Charles Haywood Ellis, who began pastoring in his late 20s, early 30s, a little storefront church in Chicago. Not like he had a whole lot of members, just family and a few people. But God bless him to start a ministry on Indiana Avenue in the 35th, in Prairie before that. And the history that I'm told about my grandfather was that they didn't have no salary for him. He had to work and do what he felt God was telling him to do. I'm told that my grandfather, Aunt Cena, uh, would preach and then change clothes after his service and go out on his pickup truck and sell watermelons and fruit because he had to feed his family. I'm told that people told him, Elder Ellis, uh, man, that don't look good. You the pastor in there, now you selling watermelon on the street. That, that don't look good. I said, man, you know, you can apply for welfare. I'm told that my grandfather said, listen, when welfare is no longer, God will still be God. He envisioned the day that we're experiencing right now. Because welfare is not what welfare used to be. Uh, keep on having babies if you want. Thinking you're getting another $34 in your check. Brothers and sisters, they're already telling you now, if you don't work, you can't get no check. And my grandfather saw that way back in the 1930s, in the 1940s, that when welfare and social governmental programs are no longer, God will still be God. And I'm not trying to do God's will on welfare. I'm trying to do it on the sweat of my brow. Move from Prairie Street to Indiana, right around, right next door, street over. 
and had a little storefront and, and later on in life in the early 50s took on a project which was probably a big project at that time and wanted to buy the purchase and the property in the storefront next door bought that and knocked the wall out in between and combined those two storefronts and now had a church building two storefront church building go back with me in 1951 52 finished that thing in 1953 and my mother says when she first went there they were in the midst of that construction project. She said a friend invited my mother's Methodist. So they, they from a town where they just had one church in Huntington, Tennessee. She said she went to church once a month. I said, why you go once a month? She goes, that was the day the Methodists had the church. I said, what do you mean? She said, the Baptist church had it on first Sunday. Then the Methodist had it on the second Sunday. And then Presbyterian had it on the third. It wasn't the one church building in the city. And they all shared the building. I said, oh. I said, well, when you want to go to another, another service in the month? Would you? She said, well, I just became Baptist. That's what her upbringing of religion was. When she gets up to Chicago to stay with her sister and somebody invites her on her job to come to this little church, she says she gets there and she said, good God almighty, uh, there ain't no windows in the church because they got construction going on. There. And she said they sitting in there with coats on, they running around dancing and she's Methodist. You know, they just sit and enjoy things. She's talking about these people have lost their mind. Lord, if you get me out of this church, I will never come back ever again. But she said there was a dark skinned fella directing the choir and he kept winking at her. Uh, so she found herself coming back and, 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 and the rest is history. Uh, here's my point. My grandfather, Ancina, uh, he, he, he expanded what he had when people told him he wasn't going to make it. He expanded what he had and had something that he was very proud of. And that November, after their church anniversary, two weeks later, had a heart attack preaching and died a week later. So then when my father comes here in 1962 to take over a very small church that doesn't have much and people told him, David, don't go to Detroit, man, that church, they don't have no money, just got a few people there and they don't have no big jobs and nothing. That church has always been in financial trouble. This church had moved from here to there to there to there to there to there, was meeting in the basement of our house and now they've got a building, but they've been there for a year and have not even paid rent. Deacon Kite knows the history. Annie Matthew, they know the history. The Greens know the history. Those that were here, Sister Spindle knows the history. The First Baptist Church of Oak Park, which is still in existence on Coolidge, just north of Oak Park Boulevard. They own that building on Puritan Dexter. They had moved out and built a church in Oak Park and allowed those folk, our people, to rent the building. They hadn't paid a mortgage. My father said when he gets here, because he know the Lord has sent him here, he goes and Deacon Kite and a couple others, they go and meet with the pastor and the board over there on Coolidge. And he explains that I'm the new pastor. I know that we owe you a year's worth of rent and you all are getting ready to evict us, but just give us a little time and, and we're going to straighten this thing up. He says they sent them out of the conference room and called them back in and said, young man, it's something about you. And we just believe that you just might be the Moses to bring these people out of the wilderness. They said, the man, the pastor asked him, what can you do? My dad said, well, uh, 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 we, 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 we promise we'll pay you, uh, if you just wipe the slate clean, we'll pay you $250 a, a, a month. And, and, and the man said, all right, we're going to hold you to that. My dad said he walked out of there and the, Lord told, and the devil told him, you fool, you ain't bringing in but $80 to $90 a week. How you going to get these people $250 and pay light bills and pay gas bills and pay insurance and all the other things that go along with having a property? And my father said he had to shake that spirit of doubt and shake that spirit of fear and believe that what he spoke was not him talking, but was God talking through him. And the, and, and the history goes, this church never missed the $250 payment until the time that we bought the church and bought it and paid it off from them. 
Why would my dad do that? I mean, I mean, why, why would he? Why, why, why would he just go back to Chicago? And, and why would he just say, "Well, you know, this ain't for me, and things ain't going, and I'm being a hit. Offering ain't getting no larger, and they can't even take care of him. He's staying with the Spindles when he first gets here. Wave your hands to the Spindle. He, he, he's staying in their house when he first gets here, and then the church is able to pay fourteen dollars a week for him to stay at the YMCA at Dexter Grand River and Grand Boulevard. Don't talk about people until you know where they come from. The easiest thing to do was to go home and tell everybody, well, I tried, but, you know, God wasn't in that thing. But he stayed here. They roped off the majority of the church, just had people on the first three rows in the church and roped everything off over there in that shotgun church at Puritan and Belden. But then God began to come in. And my dad began to speak things that God's going to send us help that we don't even know where it's coming from. God's sending us help from the north, the south, the east, and the west. God is going to do some things. Well, how can you be sure? Well, you can't make me doubt him because I know too much about him. And they said he sang that song every Sunday until the church got sick of him singing that song. Sometimes you got to sing a song that's your testimony. Sometimes you got to sing a song that's talking about where you going. Sometimes you got to sing a song that's talking about your experience. Is there anybody that ever had to sing yourself out of misery? So watch this. Now the church begins to grow. And in the 80 years, 62 to 1970, now you're putting chairs down the aisles. And now we done packed the little shotgun out and now the children got to go downstairs in the basement of the church. Uh, we didn't have children's church. They just gave us, amen, those uh, Luton's cough drops. Y'all know the ones that was candy. Amen. And gave us that. And, and we down there just playing games or what have you. And now we're moving on over to the synagogue over on Schaefer and Cambridge. It, it was the biggest church we ever seen in our lives. As a 12-year-old kid, I, I'm sitting on the front row with my yama on because it was a Jewish synagogue and they made you put those on when we went to see the church on that Sunday afternoon and it looked like I couldn't even see to the back of that church but I said man we gonna buy this big old place how we gonna fill this place up but my father had a vision because he had a father that wasn't wasn't trying to stay where he was he was trying to do something with them talents he was trying to multiply the talents that God had given him and we went in that church and then in 1976 we had to knock out some walls and, and create what we called an overflow and now that got full and, and then we needed some property but we didn't have no property because there was a Jewish supermarket on the end of the corner and New York Bagel connected to it. It was called House of Foods and, and, and we couldn't buy it because they wasn't selling it but we was playing baseball over at Palmer Park and somebody came over and said man the house of food is burning and my dad dropped everything on first base got in his car and we we flew behind him and we flew over the seven mile and Schaefer and show sure enough the supermarket was burning. They said Bishop you praying? He said no burn baby burn because God will make a way for you if he got to burn something up. The supermarket burned and we bought that property and then it came time to build because the church was still growing and now we're getting ready to build something that we ain't never seen before and you see it down there standing today at Seven Mile and Schaefer. You see what my father built there. It was because of the DNA and the inheritance and the legacy that his father left for him. Why is he doing that? He's not trying to be big. He's not trying to make himself something. It's just what he's seen all his life. It's the family that he grew up in. It's the culture that his father set for the family. It was what he saw. Yeah, God bless you with something, but he's got something bigger. Yeah, God gave you this, but he's got something else for you. So we come into what my father built up and never even believe that we would be here where we are today. But watch this. 
God has a way of promising you things, but all the time is not necessarily for you, but it's for those generations that are coming up behind you. Don't get bent out of shape when God spoke something into your spirit just because you didn't receive it. It didn't look like you were going to. David thought that he was going to build a temple up. He had already done the blueprints. He had already laid out the blueprints for the church and for the synagogue, for the temple of God. I suspect say uh, he began to raise monies uh, but then God says no I'm not going to let you build it up uh, because you've got blood on your hands but I'm going to let your son Solomon build it up uh, but this is my promise that I'm fulfilling to you uh, there are some things that you got not because of you you got it because God promised it to your mama God God promised it to your daddy God promised it to your grandparents uh, the children of Israel of Moses' generation didn't get to see the promised land, uh, but the Joshua generation, uh, they walked in and destroyed everybody in their way uh, and received everything that God uh, had promised their mamas, their daddies, uh, and their grandparents. Uh, I'm sober enough to believe uh, that what God has done for me, uh, it ain't because I'm smart. Uh, it's not because I'm so righteous. Uh, it's not because I'm so saved, uh, but it's because somebody prayed for me. Uh, somebody had me on their mind. Mind. Somebody took the time to pray for me. You better be glad you had a praying grandmother. You better be glad that you had a praying daddy. You better be glad that you had somebody to fall on their knees and to plead the blood for their children and their children's children who were not even born. Tell that neighbor, you be the one. My father, when he wanted to buy this property in 1988, told me and Trustee Hardy, wave your hand, Trustee Hardy, told me and Trustee Hardy, y'all check on that property. Look like Edgewater is for sale. And I'm riding in the car with him, both of us, and I'm figuring out my mind, why we want to buy that raggedy place? The amusement park been closed for six years, seven years. Ain't nothing out there but raggedy refrigerators and, and stoves and ovens. And it's a dump site. Ain't nothing out there but old cars and tires. Ain't nothing out there but old used stuff and furniture. People just came out here and dumped whatever they wanted to dump. And I'm looking at it and don't see nothing. Up. But my dad is looking at it, looking at it, and he's seeing something. Up. He still got that Charles Haywood Ellis the first in him. Up that he's seeing, yeah, God has blessed me down there, uh, but we might need to go a little bit higher, and we're going to need some land to do what God might tell us to do. I don't even know that he's doing something for my generation uh, and not his generation. Uh, thank God I didn't try to sabotage the program, uh, because if I told my dad, well, they want $2 million, he said, well, just forget it. Uh, good thing that we were honest with him, uh, even when we didn't see it, uh, and next thing you know, we're buying this property. Uh, why are we buying this property? That's what I'm saying in my mind. Uh, who wants that property? It's a dump. Uh, it's a dump site. But look at us in here today. Uh, and people coming in today uh, and they marvel when they walk in this building. Uh, they say, man, how long y'all done had this? Since 2002. Uh, man, it still look brand new. Uh, and they try to give me accolades and say, man, you did something up in there. Uh, but it's not what I did. Uh, it's the inheritance that has been laid up for me. Uh, it's the legacy that has been left up. Uh, why would my dad not be a builder when his dad was a builder? Why would he not be a man of faith when his dad was a man of faith? Uh, why would I not be a builder when my father was a builder? Why would I not be a man of faith when my father, my grandfather was a father, was a man of faith? Uh, he's not just the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, he's the God of Charles the first, David senior, and Charles the third. And if we teach our children, he'll be the God of Kiara and Buddy too. Am I helping somebody up in here? Ask that neighbor, what are you leaving? 
What are you leaving to the next generation? What are you doing and what are you teaching them? What are they getting from you? What are they hearing you say? And what are they watching you do? Well, Bishop, you know, my grandmother was a pistol. I mean, them folk was something else. You can ask anybody in the neighborhood and they will tell you that my grandmama and my granddaddy, they were something to deal with. Well, that you can't help that your grandmama and your granddaddy were who they were. Uh, but if God saved you, uh, then you need to stop that generational curse uh, and you need to get a new bloodline uh, and a new DNA going. Uh, Y'all ain't hearing what I'm saying. Uh, when you go to the book of Deuteronomy chapter number 28, uh, we call it the chapter of blessings. Uh, blessed shall thou be in the field uh, and blessed shall thou be in the city uh, and just blessed shall thou be in thy going out uh, and in thy coming in. Blessed shall thy be uh, in thy uprising uh, and in thy down setting up. Uh, but if you also look at and read the conclusion of that book, uh, it will tell you if you don't hearken uh, unto the word of the Lord, uh, then these curses will come upon you. Uh, you've got to determine uh, that I'm going to cut this curse off uh, and I'm going to get a blessing going uh, up in this house. Uh, you can't be who your grandmama used to be uh, if they were unsaved. They were who they were. They did uh, what they did. Uh, well, Bishop, I saw my mama and daddy fight all the time. Uh, that don't mean you got to fight your spouse. Uh, you got to be the one uh, to turn that thing around. Uh, we hear people say all the time, uh, well, I'm the first one in my family to have a degree. I'm the first one uh, to go to college. Uh, they not saying that as if they're going to be the last one, uh, but they're saying that I'm the first one uh, and I'm going to make sure that I'm the one uh, that's going to make sure that the generation up under me uh, is doing the same or better than I've done. Uh, I dare you to look at that neighbor and tell them, you be the one. You got to be the one to turn uh, that situation around. Uh, and sometimes I hear you talking uh, about your family's downfalls uh, and about your family's dysfunction uh, as though you wear it as a badge of honor. Uh, in other words, well, Bishop, you know my mama used to cuss all the time. Uh, so now you saying uh, that just because you slip every now and then, uh, that is because your mama cussed like a sailor. Uh, your daddy used to beat your mama. So now every now and then, then you slap your wife around. Uh, it's time out for that foolishness. Uh, you got to be the one uh, to say it ends right here. Uh, yes, my mama had me before she was married uh, and I had my daughter before she's married, uh, but you got to pour some oil, uh, Crisco if you ain't got none other, uh, and you got to declare it stops right here. Uh, we ain't got to keep doing what we do uh, because somebody else did it. Uh, this year, you ought to be saying I'm turning the faucet off that behavior and I'm opening up the floodgates of heaven uh, I wish I had somebody this new year uh, that want things to be bigger that want things to be better that wants to go to another level uh, stop making excuses uh, about what grandmama did uh, about what Gigi did uh, you got to start it right here uh, and say as for me and my house uh, we will will serve the Lord. Uh, the reason that my father made us go to church uh, was because his daddy made him go to church. Uh, the reason that my kids go to church uh, is because my mama made us go to church. Uh, and shame on Kier and Buddy when they have kids. Uh, if they tell them how y'all feel this morning, uh, you better feel your butt like getting up and getting on them church clothes uh, because everything in here is going to church. Uh, we ain't been perfect, but if it worked for great granddaddy uh, if it work for granddaddy uh, if it work for us uh, it'll work for you I wish I had a witness up in here somebody shout thank you Jesus uh, you got to understand uh, that the curses of the Lord uh, they will flow that the curses of the enemy rather uh, they will flow uh, and the Lord will use the enemy uh, to afflict you or to chastise you uh, but just like there are curses uh, there are blessings uh, you can call them generational blessings uh, you can call them family
family blessings. Uh, you can call them whatever you want to call them. Uh, but you better thank God uh, if you had a praying granddaddy. Uh, you better thank God uh, if you had a praying mother. Uh, and if you ain't had neither one of them, uh, you better say it starts with me. Uh, I dare to tell that neighbor you be the one. Uh, you be the one to bring God up in that house. Uh, you be the one to bring a Bible up in that family. Uh, you be the one to bring godliness up in there. Uh, am I talking to somebody up in here? Uh, I wish somebody this beginning of the year uh, would say the curses stop right here. Uh, they stop right here today. Uh, my family will not be destroyed. Uh, I don't care if I was on drugs. Uh, I don't care if my daddy was on drugs. Uh, I don't care if my granddaddy was on drugs. Uh, now that God has saved me, uh, the great thing about being born again uh, is that old things uh, are passed away. Uh, Paul said, forgetting those things uh, which are behind and I'm reaching uh, unto those things which are before. Uh, is there anybody uh, that's looking to see what God has uh, in this brand new year? Uh, is there anybody uh, that believes God's got some blessings for you uh, in this brand new season? in this brand new time just look at that neighbor and point to that neighbor and tell them neighbor don't care who your granddaddy was don't care if your mama was a witch and your granddaddy was a warlock now that you saved you better walk by faith and not by sight stop talking about who you were raised by you got a new father you had a blood transfusion You've got the Holy Ghost uh, that's dwelling on the inside. Uh, and you be the one uh, to turn that thing around. Uh, you be the one uh, to say it stops here. Uh, you be the one uh, to say my children uh, will be saved. Uh, my grandchildren uh, will be saved. Uh, my great grandchildren uh, will be blessed. Uh, I decree it. Uh, I declare. I speak it. I'm sending a praise and prayers the day that won't even manifest until 30 years from now. But my great grandchildren, they'll be walking around doing the work of the Lord. And hopefully they'll say, Somebody prayed for me when I couldn't pray for myself. Somebody got on their knees for me when I didn't feel like praying. Somebody laid out uh, before the Lord on my behalf. Uh, am I talking to somebody? Uh, am I talking to anybody? Uh, does it sound good? Uh, then shout glory up in here. Uh, shout glory again. Uh, you got to be careful uh, of the things that you speak. Uh, you got to be careful uh, of the things that you say. Uh, we had our bowling appreciation uh, for everybody that volunteered. Uh, for a graceful Christmas uh, only yesterday uh, at the bowl in Alley uh, I was fellowshipping uh, with the people of God uh, we had great camaraderie uh, great fun food uh, and fellowship uh, and I had one the little baby uh, that was bowling on my lane uh, little Drew uh, where's Drew uh, is she out there uh, is she sleep or is she woke uh, wake her up uh, bring her here daddy uh, little drew uh, she was bowling uh, on my lane uh, drew uh, wouldn't leave me alone uh, drew uh, every time she bowled uh, and got done uh, she came and stood by me uh, and got so comfortable uh, she started leaning on me uh, and talking to me uh, like i was her age uh, she said bishop uh, you ought to let me preach one sunday uh, i said Drew, 
you can't preach. She said, yes, I can. I be practicing at home. I said, Drew, wait a minute. I said, I went to the elementary Sunday school department when they had their Christmas play. I said, and it came time for you to do your part. And you wouldn't even take the mic. I said, I can't give you the mic. And you not know what you're going to say. She said, Bishop, that's because I forgot my speech. And I didn't want to speak and say the wrong thing. I said, that'll work when you're preaching. She said, but I'm telling you, if you let me preach, they're going to say, he ought to let her preach more often. I said, girl, you got a whole lot of confidence. I said, what you going to preach? She started saying things. I'm going to preach that God's going to turn it around. I'm going to preach that if you do what God says, he'll do what you need him to do. And she started saying all these quotes to me. I said to myself, she's listening and I think she's sleeping. She said, Bishop, are we going bowling? Are we going to the show tomorrow? I said, Drew, what are you talking about? I said, we can't go to the show because it's Sunday. I said, we got to go to church. She said, but you said, I'm going to take y'all bowling and to the show. I said, yeah, I said that. I said, but what I meant, I'm going to take the young folk bowling and the old people to the show. She said, oh, I get it now. I hear to tell mama and daddy, she ain't going to be dancing on no pole. She ain't having no baby out of wedlock. She said she gonna be a preacher. And I'm practicing already. That's what the word says. When it says train up a child in the way that she could go. Don't try to make her something when she already determined that she gonna be a woman of God. She gonna be a prophetess. She gonna be an evangelist. And she's already practicing. You better get it in your children. You better teach it. You better live it. You better read it. You better share it. Because what you put in them is coming up out of them. Give God praise. Look at somebody and tell a neighbor, you be the one to be saved. You be the one to live for God. You be the one to call for blessings. You be the one to be the righteous of God. You be the one to give God a hand clap. You be the one to shout for joy. You be the one to serve God. And what you see, if you do it, they'll watch you and try to do what you do. Don't worry about who your grandmama was. Don't worry about who your daddy was. Old things are passed away. And old things begin with you. You do it. You speak it. You live it. And it will. It will. It will come to pass. Shall glory. Shall glory. Tell that neighbor you be the one. It ends here. All things are become brand new. Stop wearing dysfunction as a badge of honor. But Bishop, man, you would understand me if you knew my grandmother. I don't want to know your grandmother. I want to know who God is calling you to be. I don't want to know your granddaddy. Forget what your mama did. That's over and done. You got to move forward from where you are. 
No, see, 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 Bishop, the way I go on, the reason I go off every now and then, because my mama used to go off all the time. Stop that making that okay for your destructive behavior. Just because your daddy cussed like I say, that don't mean you got to cuss. Hello, somebody. Sometimes we use it as an excuse. No, you just go off because you're hateful sometimes. That's all. And no, see, no. Uh, bitch, I'm telling you, see, see, see my, my mama kept up more stuff in the church. No, you're just a busybody. That's all. Stop talking about what somebody else did. And walking in dysfunction. Somebody who grew up in a family and nobody went past eighth grade, became a college graduate. And said, I'm the first one. But I guarantee you, I won't be the last. Because I've created a new DNA. I've created a new bloodline. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. And behold, how many? All things are become new. What are you leaving as an inheritance? What are you leaving as a legacy? No, Bishop, I ain't got a whole lot of money. I ain't talking about money. If you got something, you ought to leave something. No, Bishop, I ain't got a whole lot of property and stuff. I ain't talking about that. But if you got something, you ought to leave something. The intangible things. The immaterial things. No wonder Paul said, we look not at the things which are seen. He said, but we look at the things which are not seen. Y'all know the word. Why, Paul? Because the things which are seen are only temporary. We know that. You ain't got no car you had 15 years ago. I'm sorry, two of y'all do. <laughs> only by choice. Things you had five years ago don't mean nothing. You're throwing it out. The end of the year, you see people throwing stuff out on the front lawn. Man, they throwing that out. Man, anybody can have it. That still look like it's good. It is good. Why are you throwing it away? Don't mean nothing to me no more. Paul said, the things which are seen are temporary. He said, but the things which are not seen are eaten. That means they last forever. Maybe you're not a third generation Pentecostal like me, and I'm not saying I'm better than nobody. But I thank God that he brought me up in a church home. I thank God that he brought me up in a church environment. I thank God that David and Wilma Ellis didn't let me pick and choose what I wanted to do. Brothers and sisters, I guarantee you, Captain Kangaroo would have won every Sunday morning. Some of y'all know what that is. You want to go to church or you want to stay home watch Captain Kangaroo? Captain Kangaroo? Mr. Green, green Jeans and Bunny Rabbit. They would have won every Sunday morning. Thank God they didn't let me choose. My daddy said, as for me and my house, and we know that's not talking about everybody in your house. It's talking about, as for me, and everything within this earthly house. But my daddy expanded that to be as for me, and my house, and y'all's house too, as long as y'all in my house. We will serve the Lord. Well, daddy, I, I was in church, and I wasn't paying no attention, but you're going to be in church. But daddy, when y'all was praying, I was on my knees laughing. When well, you gonna be on your knees? Are y'all hearing what I'm saying? Uh, Teresa got the Holy Ghost because she was had to live it anyhow. So she said, I might as well get it. Ain't no sense of me going to church and not graduate. Cause we gonna go to church. That's what it was. And guess what? I'm young, trying to get away from it. Don't even know how blessed I am. 
it's not until the ends of your life that you really start appreciating how God set that thing up from the beginning of time. I don't know what your family background has. I don't know what, I don't know nothing about it unless you shared it with me. But you got to determine that I'm going to be the one. I'm going to be the one to turn that faucet off. And we can return on this faucet. The curses are over. The dysfunction is over. And as for me and my house, I'm going to serve the Lord and pray that God honors my prayers that I might never see fulfilled. But I know through faith that if I sow, the harvest is coming at the appropriate time. Some of you are reaping harvests from somebody before you that deposited some prayers that you're making withdrawals right now. Don't get high-minded and think you all that. Some of your prayers won't even be realized until your children come of age or your children's children. A good person leaves an inheritance to their children's children. Come on this morning. The first Sunday of the year, everybody standing. On this day, we look to the Lord. We say to him, have your own way, Lord. We say to him on this day, Lord, I give you my all. The first Sunday of the year. You know, I think I'm going to church the first Sunday of the year. Man, I'm so proud of you. I'm so glad for you. I'm so happy for you. Now, you do know that there's a second Sunday of the year. You do know Sunday comes every seven days. Well, Bishop, you know, my family, you know, they, they were just, you know, good CMEs, Christmas, Mother's Day, and Easter. Will you be the one to start that generation? where it's reasonable to give God some hours on the first day of the week. You be the one that declares it's important enough for me not to try to fit the Lord in, but to make space for the Lord. And everything else has to fit in around him. You be the one. Tell the neighbor, you be the one. You be the one.